Well, welcome uh, to the 2014 Edith Dominion Memorial Lecture. Evidence is central to everything one plus one does. It's our springboard for developing practical solutions to problems we identify. But sharing evidence is also a really key activity for the organization. One plus one started early in the 1970s. The relational landscape was changing, divorce rising. And the questions then were why and how to cope with the consequences. But since then, we have been discovering how strong relationships can be potent protectors for adults and children across the life course, buffering stress and adversity. The capacity to make and maintain relationships contributes to resilience. At the start of this century, One Plus One established our biennial lecture. I have to say, actually, this is a triennial lecture because we haven't had one for three years. But leading scholars present evidence to an audience of researchers, policymakers, practitioners, and uh, media to stimulate innovative thinking about the changing nature of relationships and how to support them in modern times. And until her death in 2005, Edith Dominion was a constant and energetic supporter of One Plus One, the organization her husband, Jack, Dr. Jack Dominion, founded. And it's wonderful to see Jack here with us tonight. And indeed, um, many of his family, his daughters. Now, Edith was from Northumberland, and uh, she just loved getting people together to share ideas and knowledge and food and drink. And we commemorate her life in naming this lecture after her. This lecture in 2014 is in collaboration with Closer. And we're also very grateful to the British Library for this marvellous venue and to the Nuffield Foundation and the Dominion family for supporting the event. Um, and I should add that by um, pr the very generous provision of the venue tonight, we have been able to use some of the Nuffield funding for bursaries for eight postgraduate students um, who will be um, attending both the lecture and the seminar tomorrow. It helps to pay for their travel to um, London and to stay overnight. And that's really important because part of what we need to do is to invest in the um, evidence gatherers of tomorrow. So I'm just going to now hand over to Michael Burke, um, probably needs no introduction, but Michael, uh, journalist, presenter of the uh, Moral Maze, award-winning journalist, um, a great friend to One Plus One. He was a trustee and he's now a patron, um, and he very generously gives his time up for these kinds of events. So welcome, Michael, and he will introduce George. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Penny, good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> the Grant Study of Human Development at Harvard University is one of the most fascinating social research projects ever undertaken. It's the most long-lasting, longitudinal study that's ever been done, an attempt to answer the big questions about what makes a good, happy, successful life with, as our speaker tonight says, a telescope, not a microscope. It's followed 268 men since the late 1930s, from the time that they entered Harvard around the age of 19 until, well now, uh, when they're well into their 90s, those that survived. There have been at least four generations of researchers to follow this one generation of very particular people, all male, all white, all by definition, you would think, uh, pretty bright. You would have thought from wealthy, or at least middle class, supportive backgrounds, though that turns out not to be universally true. Young men with the best chance of leading successful lives, you'd think. Indeed, one, John Kennedy, became president, three others ran for the Senate, and another, Ben Bradley, editor of the Washington Post at the time of Watergate, we journalists hold in special reverence. They were exceptions, not only because, almost by accident, we've come to know their names, Success was not universal, and in any way, a more rounded definition of a successful life has been one of the great achievements of the study. So most of these men have been examined uh, all their adult lives, measuring everything from major organ function to the hanging length of the scrotum, apparently. Something one had better not call a yardstick, I suppose. <laughs> 
But most of all, their attitudes, their sense of happiness or its opposite, what caused them joy or misery, satisfaction or display, uh, and implicit in that, the nature and strengths and weaknesses of the relationships that they made. The principal investigator on the study for three decades, and the man who will forever be associated with it is our speaker tonight. Professor George Valiant, a psychiatrist, joined the study in 1967 and retired from it, if indeed he has, in real terms, uh, only relatively recently. He's written several really important books based on its data. The latest is called The Triumph of Experience. The interest for him, he has written, is not what life dealt these men, but how they coped with it. His study, and although uh, there were many working on it before him and after him, it will always be his study, is important on so many levels. It's reflected the changing preoccupations of medical and social scientists over the decades. In the early days, it sometimes seemed to be a short history of masturbation. <laughs> today, as you will see from today's papers anticipating this event, the interest is in how good relationships in the absence of extraneous illness lead to mental and physical health. The papers today have uh, lit on Professor Valiant's view based on the study that marriage gets better after 70, which might which might to some seem a rather long time to wait, uh, <laughs> though I'm 68, so it's good news for me. <laughs> Events and changing hormones combined to create a more level playing field then, he says, or would do if your knees were up to it. Uh, above all, I suppose, what Professor Valiant has to say is of the greatest interest to policymakers faced with the rapidly increasing demands of a rapidly increasing older age group in Western societies. Uh, after his lecture, Professor Valiant will join a small panel of people with special interests in this subject to kick around his ideas and his conclusions with you. It's a very inclusive discussion uh, after the lecture. Uh, it's stimulating stuff, and there'll be stimulating stuff uh, of another kind after that, where we can carry on the discussion in a less formal way uh, in a reception next door. I do hope you'll stay for that. But first of all, the main event, the grant study, 75 years into the making. Please welcome Professor George Valiant. George. Penny, what a wonderful honor and privilege it is to be invited to give the 2014 uh, Edith Dominion Lecture and Mr. Burke that's the best introduction I've ever gotten. <laughs> Absolutely inspired and uh, saves me doing a lot of talking. <laughs> Clearly, what the grant study was trying to do, and Michael Rudder can tell you later that I would have received the diagnosis of oppositional disorder as a child, was to prove Michael Apter and um, St. Ignatius wrong. Peep and William James also. People keep growing all their lives. And the only way you can appreciate that is not looking at people two years at a time, which I'll show you the dangers of tomorrow, or even a decade or 20 years. The original marriage researchers bemoaned that probably a 40-year marriage was different from a 20-year marriage, but nobody lived long enough to follow marriages for 40 years. And so that it's my joy to talk about a 60-year marriage, and the only thing that I love more than the longevity of the grant study is the longevity of the British Museum. <laughs> love, especially unconditional love, cures people, both those who give it and those who receive it. To receive love is transformational, kissed by a loving Princess, the ugly toad, becomes the prince. But healing love is more often in the witnessing of other people rather than in trying to rescue them. Just being seen 
is terribly important. In 1977, when I was still wet behind the ears and the men were 55, I made the rash pronouncement that divorce was a sign of mental illness and personality disorder. And my wise editor took me aside and said, George, it's not divorce that's bad. It's loving people for long periods of time that is good. And thus, in its own small way, the Grant study has echoed Michael Rudder's great um, lesson that it's not the bad things that happen to us that shake our shape our lives, but it's, it's the good things. In 1977, like Eric Erickson, I called the process of getting stably married, making a commitment to another person that in our study was arbitrarily set at 10 years. Erickson called it intimacy, I called it intimacy. We were both wrong. I think the term commitment works much better. Like all developmental tasks, capacity for mutual interdependence comes later in some people's lives, 40, 50, even one man who fell in love at 80. Uh, but most people get there in spite of what the English press suggests. But when you follow marriages for 50 years, for some, this commitment leads to joy. And for others, it becomes strained. Quotes, we remained married by decision, not by desire. And that was true of about a third of the golden anniversaries. The emotional intimacy of deep relationships is different from the simple Ericksonian task of tolerating physical and practical proximities. For example, a disastrous first marriage that ended in divorce at midlife at age 85, Charles Boatwright could describe the pleasure of his three decades long second marriage as, quotes, really just being together, share each other's lives and our children's lives, snuggle on cold nights. Or take Jim Hart, who after 50 years of marriage told the study that his wife, Julia, was the essence of his life, and he called their relationship a lovely, lovely partnership. Asked what his hopes were for his marriage in the future, he said it can't get any better. Just stay the way it is. Um, Julia's view of their marriage was that they were best friends. Quotes, there's a physical relationship. This is at age 75 if not quite what it was when we were young. But the main thing is, I adore him more than I ever did. We laugh a lot. We laugh at ourselves. We don't take ourselves too seriously, which is probably the most important rule of aging you're going to hear from me. <laughs> I don't know how we got here, but it's wonderful. Equally important, Julia explained, we hold each other loosely. And I suspect her phrase, we hold each other loosely, is perhaps the single one-liner that you should take home tonight. Some couples have a shared emotional economy. There's a correlation between them. They're under each other's skin and happy to have it so. That was anathema to Freud. But intimacy is a knack, like carrying a tune. Not everyone cares about it. 26 of the 200 
and 68 original study members were excluded due to early withdrawal or death. Of the remaining men, 3% never married, and 173 married only once. At the end of the day, 51 of those 173 marriages remained happy for roughly half a century, including one man who lived happily with another man in interdependent fashion for 50 years. 73 of the stable marriages were rated so-so, and I'll give an example of that in a little time. And 49 remained for a lifetime in poor 50-year marriages. Counter to my belief when I was beginning the study, 23 of the 62 men who divorced contracted very happy marriages that lasted until they or their wives died. By 85, their psychosocial adjustment was just as good as the married men who married happily for life. The mean length of surviving marriage for the men who survived is over 60 years, and the mean length of the 23 men who divorced and eventually happily remarried was almost 33 years. So how did we know who was happily married and who wasn't? One was every four or five years sending him the questions on this slide. And men could lie for five years or 10 years or 15 years. But when you get these questionnaires after 50 years, the warts start to show. Uh, but, and, and this is a plea to policymakers who love statistics and uh, huge uh, amounts of data that one story is worth a thousand words, or as E.E. E. Cummings said, only sons of bitches measure spring with a thermometer. <laughs> so where did our information come from? Qualitative responses certainly helped fill in the story. Uh, men with poor marriages wrote, quote, she has an inferiority complex or quotes, I'm more affectionate than her, or quotes, she likes her beer, <laughs> or quotes, it's easier to suffer with her than without her, or quotes, we live in suffer rooms, or from one very proper Bostonian, when she throws the plates, I catch them. I never throw them back. <laughs> when she hits me, I never hit her back. Then he conceded, quotes, although I've slapped her a few times to bring her to her senses, close quotes. <laughs> that was a 50-year marriage. The following quotes describe happy marriages. My wife is the kindest and most considerate person I've ever known. Our marriage is completely challenging, completely exciting. Quotes, tennis doubles with my wife is my greatest enjoyment. Quotes, I'm very proud of her. Quotes, I love and admire her. She's my best friend. Quotes, our marriage is great in capital letters. My wife's been the best thing that ever happened to me. The annual or biennial questions sent every one or two years also included essay type questions which work pretty well for Harvard men who have trouble stopping talking. Of the 30 surviving men who in midlife reported unhappy marriages, only five reported happy marriages at 85. Four of those five marriages were after their first wife had died. More startling was that 23 of the surviving uh, 
second, third, or fourth marriages were exciting and satisfying for more than three decades. The single most important factor, and this again policy uh, makers take notice, was that 34 of the divorces, 57% of the divorces, one or the other member of the couple was alcoholic. And Michael Rutter's colleague, Griffith Edwards, grew me himself to be interested in alcohol. But if you read two of the most important and fattest books on marriage ever written by Lewis Terman and, um, oh dear, I'm blocking on his name, but um, it'll come to me. Um, don't even mention uh, alcohol. Uh, John Gottman. Uh, in 1977, when I first looked at the causes of divorce, I blamed personality disorder, poor relationship, poor coping style, which I wish policymakers would be interested in, but they're not. Um, for example, passive aggression, acting out, and projection. The implication of alcohol abuse in divorce was discovered only after the study had been funded for 70 years. Again, even though it seems like throwing good money after bad to keep longitudinal studies going, the longer you wait, the more fruit the tree bears. I've already mentioned that marital researchers bemoan the fact that studying marriage took more than one generation. As Mr. Burke pointed out, the grant study has had four generations. The fourth gener uh, member, Bob Aldinger, you'll hear in a minute, followed the men by videotape discussing conflictual situations with their wives and then stayed in touch with them and studied neuroimaging of their brains. That's marital research in the future. I'm not going to go there. But in order to make tangibles, intangibles tangible, in order to measure spring, I'm going to tell you three stories. Of the Hundreds of children who reported on their parents' marriage, there was only one family where all four daughters said, my parents' marriage is much better than my friend's parents' marriage. And one even scribbled in, much, much better. By the time Frederick Chip was 80, he and his wife have been giving their marriage rave reviews for six decades. The first time he met Catherine, he wrote his mother, I've met the girl I'm going to marry. Now, it took him about five years to get her to come round to his point of view, <laughs> but they've been married ever since. When he was 75, he described in their interview how their relationship has evolved. And this doesn't mean that marriage is, is always easy. He was a macho kind of guy, and the way their relationship has evolved is she has become more confident, and I have learned to adjust. Uh, in their teens, the two of them sailed together the day after my 80th interview, 80, when they were 80, um, my interview with them, they were going sailing for two weeks uh, together off Nova Scotia. He said, that's very solemnly, he said it, that's important time. <coughs> Yet they didn't live in each other's pockets. I asked him what it was like being home for lunch. 
He said Catherine had different lives and different passions. They had supper and breakfast together, but they never ate lunch together. Um, I asked what they did together, and he pointed to the garden. Catherine does the planting and the harvesting, and I do the heavy lifting. Uh, together, they read to each other at night. At that current time, they were reading Odenaci's The English Patient. But it was clear that humor, again, one of those involuntary modes of coping, played an important part of the relationship. When I was talking to him, he asked his wife to come into the room. I, mine just can't remember anything. She replied, so what's new? <laughs> Reminded me of another marriage where uh, it was clearly a good marriage. And on that questionnaire I showed you a minute ago, oh, it's right there. Uh, has divorce ever been considered? And she scribbled it underneath because the same questionnaire was given to the wives on four occasions as well as to the men. Divorce. Never. Murder? Frequently. <laughs> uh, they participated in Robert Waldinger's study of marital intimacy. And he's the fourth generation that's kept the study going. And he asked them to engage in a conflict-laden subject. They talked about the need for them helping two disabled relatives. Every comment either of them made was aimed at the topic and moved them closer to a solution. There were a couple that danced beautifully, and at the end of the interview, Catherine said as an offside, he's awfully easy to live with. When I asked Chip how he and his wife depended on each other, he looked off into space, choked up, and fought back tears. Gosh, he said, just by being there, if she goes first, it'll be pretty traumatic. She did, and it was, and he's dealt with his grief by frequently remembering her and frequently weeping and keeping the joy of that marriage alive. My next example is a proper Bostonian I'll call John Adams. Uh, he had gone through four marriages when I clearly wrote him off as a no-hoper the four marriages had lasted in toto for nine years. <laughs> At the age of 45, he met his current wife, Nancy, and has spent the last 42 years living with her happily indeed. Now, just to put this in perspective, let me tell you about Dr. Carlton Tarrington, who also had five marriages. <laughs> His marriages fell apart because he lost control of his use of alcohol. And when he went off the wagon, his fifth marriage, he finally took his own life. Now, when they were in college, you couldn't have told Tarrington apart from John Adams. They had the lowest grades of any grant study boys in the study. They were feckless. They both were heavy drinkers. But remember, there's a difference between Winston Churchill, who drank often and large amounts and never lost control of his use of alcohol. And that's what's wrong with most of the public policy studies, like Marmots, who say they control for alcohol 
but they only control for quantity frequency, which counts for nothing. What counts for alcoholism is does it cause problems in your life? And for John Adams, it didn't. By the time they were 30, their lives started to diverge. Adams was on the law review at Stanford, joined a good um, law firm, where in contrast for Tarryton, alcoholism stops maturation in its tracks, and he died sort of a perpetual boy at 50. At 40, Adams won an award for public service and was made partner. Of course, during this time, it wasn't all good news. He'd gone through four marriages in rapid order. But he had some insight into his marital problems, which were due, he thought, to his own emotional immaturity. But again, one of the great lessons of the Grant Study is if you can just be patient enough, adolescents grow up. You may have to wait till they're 50, but it happens. And so he met Nancy at 45, who was a highly competent, emotionally supportive person, could stand on her own and give Adam some of the caretaking he needed from an unhappy childhood rather than demanding that he take care of her. In his 50s, after seven years of marriage, he confessed to incurable optimism. He stopped asking, answering questionnaires for a while, but when he resumed at 60, he said his marriage was perfectly happy and suggested it's maturity that makes the marriage work. Adams had a daughter by this finally successful marriage who wrote to him when she was 18, I can't begin to tell you, Dad, what a role model you've been to me. You've been my support, my advisor, and my teacher. And after 30 years of follow-up and a little help from his friends, Adams indeed had become what Erickson would call generative. When Adams was 80, he was interviewed by someone who mistrusted his optimism. She granted that the marriage was good, but she gave the entire credit to his wife. But so what? How many 85-year-olds do you know that are still playing tennis, whose only medicine they take is Viagra, <laughs> and considers the present the happiest of their life? What were the differences between good and bad marriages? Divorce was most common among the alcoholic and the feckless, while bad marriages that tended to endure occurred among men who were depressed and men with bleak childhoods. Once alcoholism was controlled for, we found no evidence that, uh, of earlier death among the happy and unhappy marriages, in spite of the promise of my title, uh, Penny will need to learn that I lie. Um, surprisingly, bleak childhoods, poor marriages among parents, deep religious involvement, and even sustained Catholic faith did not statistically affect divorce or quality of marriage. Correlated with good marriages, where psychosocial maturity, whether defined by generativity or um, mature involuntary um, coping mechanisms, or by rich social relationships apart from marriage. In other words, emotional intelligence. Humor, sublimation, was seen among the best marriages. Projection, Pollyanna denial and passive aggression among the worst. The decathlon is just a 10 event measure of working, loving, and playing. 
54 of the grant study men celebrated golden anniversaries, but they did so in marriages that were not particularly conflicted, nor particularly loving. Their relations with their children and siblings were just as good as those of the happily married. Their childhoods were no less caring, their adaptive styles no less good, and they remained sexually active no less long. So what was different? The men reported that they were very content significantly less often than the men with happy marriages. And they'd been significantly less close with their fathers. And this was a surprise because everybody thinks it's mothers and how close you are to your mothers doesn't seem to make a difference. A very smart reporter said, George, why do you think it was important being close to your fathers? And I said, I don't have the foggiest idea. What do you think? And she said, well, I think if you're close to your father, your father probably had a good marriage, and he modeled for you how to be a good husband. And that's as good an answer as I can give you. But let me tell you about a so-so marriage. Committed, yes. Intimate, no. As a boy, Frost walked three miles to the two-room schoolhouse he went to in winter, and in summer, seven days a week, he milked cows for his dad's dairy farm. He had the insight at 10 to know he was lonely, to know that he wanted to talk to people, not cows, and decided at 10 years old, living on a Vermont dirt farm, that when he grew up, he was going to go to college, and then he was going to go to Harvard Law School. And that's exactly what he did. There was little outward warmth in the Frost family. They cared about each other, but they never said so. Uh, the mother said nothing much about Evan except he was nice to live with. When we had a job and it needed to be done neatly, we called on Evan. Feelings were not discussed. Evan told the study psychiatrist each of these men were seen 10 hours by a psychiatrist in college. Quotes that Evan said, the family bonds have been almost entirely lacking insofar as the tie of intimacy was concerned. He was valedictorian of his high school class. He ran the school. But he felt his greatest strength was his ability to make friends. He preferred team sports. When he entered the grant study, he was observed to be well-poised, extremely friendly, active, forceful, energetic. But even at 18, Frost knew he paid a price for his self-sufficiency. He admired the kind of marriage in which couples became completely absorbed in each other. But that kind of marriage wasn't for him. Although I hate nobody, he told the study psychiatrist, I'm sometimes afraid I can't love anybody. I'm so self-sufficient. I don't have any rough spots. It's nothing really bothers me. And I realize that's not necessarily an ideal constitution. He realized it could be irritating to others. When he was in college, one observer called him supernormal. When I interviewed him at 45, I thought he was supernormal, except in terms of intimacy. Every time I started asking Eben, about closeness, he balked like a horse and made it clear that the conversation was to go somewhere else. In his entire life, he'd never found a friend to confide in. He designed his own house. He was president of the PTA. He was now responsible for training young associates 
and could say with enthusiasm, my job turns me on. But with all his repeated assertions that he was easy to get along with, life wasn't so silky at home. His children had never seen his parents fight. They'd never seen them express affection to each other, and they thought the only thing that held them together was uh, religion and the children. And yet the curious thing is just as lots of lonely people can hug puppies, Eben Frost was just wonderful and loving with his grandchildren and took them on vacations in which he'd never taken his own children. I asked them all after they were retired, what do you do for lunch? And he said, he made sure to be out of the house all day. When I asked how he and his wife depended on each other, he said, his wife was self-sufficient. She has different interests. He liked art, she liked music. Now, people can have intense reactions to a story like this. Like divorce, it evokes a lot of personal and sometimes conflicted associations. To the young and intense, it may sound like a tragic abdication of passion. To the old and tired, it may sound like a rueful reflection on dreams that never came true. To those living in marital war zones, it may sound like blessed relief. But what's important is like musical talent, the talent for intimacy lies on a continuum. There's a lot of room between a tin ear and an ear for perfect pitch. And I believe the capacity for intimate marriage is a little bit like that capacity for perfect pitch in music. Although less mentally healthy than Frost, John Adams learned and cared about intimacy. Frost never cared to. Another provocative issue is the place dependence of dependence in a successful marriage. Dependence is a dirty word. Codependence is an even dirtier word. But mutual dependence is still allowed. And the study suggests that some kinds of mutual dependence were extremely healing. Even when it isn't needed for healing, mutual dependence has its own pleasures. Transcripts from the happily married men are full of unapologetic praise for mutual dependence. As Catherine Chip said in one of her interviews, it's very strengthening to have a person you can always turn to. And again, the study documented, which uh, Laura Carstensen has studied in much better detail, that life gets better after 70. During the period from 20 to 70, only 18% of both partners from the entire sample reported their marriage as happy. By 75, half the surviving men did. And by 85, the proportion of happy marriages had risen to 76%. Some of this improvement, no doubt, reflected the men's increased tolerance for mutual dependence as they aged. As one 85-year-old, hitherto very independent man, acknowledged, macho man, quotes, you let your wife learn about you because all of his male friends had died. Certainly, more of the men learned to have see mutual dependence as an opportunity rather than a threat. And after 70, people find their marriages more precious. As one 78-year-old man wrote, 
Jane and I are at the age when the life we have left together is like the last few days of a great vacation. You want to get the most out of them, and we want to get the most out of our togetherness. Again, with the passage of time, as Mr. Burke said, hormones tend to feminize the men and masculinize the women, making the playing field more level. Third, physical infirmities of old age make people really appreciate that there's someone else there to help them. And, and finally, there's the well-documented U-curve, where in terms of if you follow people's happiness over a lifetime, the worst time is in midlife when you've got dependent parents and ungrateful dependent adolescents <laughs> to deal with at the same time. There were two areas where our data was weak, besides the fact that it obviously was a highly selected sample. The first was the worse the marriage got, the less forthcoming either the wife or the husband was. And the second was that you only needed to hint that you were asking about sexuality and the men didn't answer the questionnaire. Jesse Bernard, the sociologist and feminist, famously said, in every marriage there are two marriages, and his marriage <laughs> is better than hers. <laughs> the grant study didn't bear that out. The, the satisfaction in marriages was pretty um, equal. The reasons for divorce have been one of Arlie Bach's founding questions when he first founded the study in 1938. He appreciated that his question could only be answered in the context of lifetimes. And at the end of the day, it was interesting to compare the final remarriages of divorced men and the marriages of the men who remained unhappily married. Clearly, divorce is bad. It rarely makes for happy children. But if you look at it over decades, only divorce can provide an opportunity for new go. On the one hand, the unhappy marriages that stayed together often involved alcoholism and depression which makes it tough on everybody. On the other hand, there's something to be said for marrying for richer, for poorer, and sickness, and in health. So there's no, I'm not giving you any prescription, I'm only giving you um, food for thought. As one couple said, we're just a couple of latter-day Victorians who wouldn't face divorce anyway. Another with a bad marriage wrote, divorce is pretty unthinkable, so I grin and bear it. Our marriage would have probably ended 15 years ago, but for religion and the presence of children. So what does the 75 years of grant study have us to teach us about marriage, intimacy, and mental health, besides long-term follow-up is good, and the people who run the big numbers statistical studies should pause, smell the roses, and try to measure spring with something else than a thermometer. The um, big lesson is that the best marriages get better with time and maturing couples get better at the golden rule. At 65, one man observed, his love for his wife Susie was now much deeper than at the beginning. 12 years later, at 77, he confided to the study, as life gets shorter, I love Susie even more. In empathic marriages, too, 
It's empathic eye contact, touch, and appreciation, and allowing the other to feel seen. Co-investigators Helen Fisher and Arthur Aaron, who've used neuroimaging to study love in college, found that in the early months of falling in love, the um, parts of the brain light up our primitive reptilian lust in terms of the brain reward circuitry. But after two years, loving attachment is in the areas of all about the other, the part of the brain that subserves both empathy and the opiate release of altruism. With time, eros grew dimmer, and the parts of the brain that reflect empathic attachment lit up. As Shakespeare told us, ripeness is all. Thank you for listening. <laughs>